This is hardly a time for levity. Well, my cousin Dale was always fighting bad ideas. See, Dale loved Christmas. We used to call him Jingle Dale. He wanted Christmas to last all year long. He sure would scream out when his mama told him it was summertime and Christmas was six months off. Dale said that trust and the spirit of Christmas was destroyed by ideas being controlled by aliens wearing black gloves. These aliens would get Dale to do all kinds of things. Aunt Rudy told Dale that one day he would realize that the alien wearing the black gloves was him and him alone. Dale was learning a hard lesson. He got so he'd stay up all night making sandwiches. Dale, what are you doing? I'm making my lunch! Mama told me, Aunt Rudy, this is Dale's mama. Found cockroaches in Dale's underwear. One time, she found Dale putting one big cockroach right on his anus. It ain't so funny now, though. Dale disappeared. Nobody's seen him since. <laughs> Well, greetings, Manchester. I have one of uh, Representative Fortune's fellow lawmakers from what I call the Concord Clown College. He's actually my representative, Tim Smith, Hillsborough District 17. Now, uh, the, the infamous Representative Jingle Dell might be a figment of my imagination, but Tim, is he that outlandish a satire on some of the people you have to deal with up at the at put the clown college? Um, well, there's there's an interesting principle uh, called Poe's law, and the idea is that any political ideology can be taken to such an extreme where satire becomes indistinguish indistinguishable from reality, and we definitely have some colorful individuals and some, you know, pretty disastrous policy suggestions that really push Poe's law and disbelief of satire all the way up to the limit. Well, I've often said that we live in an era that is beyond satire because nothing like uh, Representative Jingledell, incidentally, that's Crispin Glover, you probably know from Back to the Future, and that's from David Lynch's a uh, misunderstood masterpiece, Wild at Heart, which uh, won the Cannes Film Festival Best Film, but didn't go over very well with American audiences, but it's one of my favorites. Check it out. But uh, Jingle Dell might be a figment of the imagination, but I understand that you sit in front of a section of what we can call Republicans, but there are other names that we could use for them, because this isn't the Republican Party that even existed up until maybe just several years ago. Uh, it's called Murderer's Row. Well, that's what... They Why call are they it, called Murderer's Row? It's sort of a tongue-in-cheek. That's um, their own name? As yeah. Al Baldessaro, uh, one of the heavy hitters in uh oh yeah i'm i'm not sure who who first came up with that phrase um it, it got tossed around as a joke during the the first couple of weeks when the seating assignments came out and i i guess it's stuck um they, they use it sort of you know affectionately uh, to describe their their little seating section because they've got um some of the the main members of the the house republican alliance are all seated right next to each other uh which incidentally is right behind me and uh they're, aren't they in exile? They were supporters of Bill O'Brien. Al Baldessaro not only was a vocal supporter, he actually attacked Sean Jasper, who was the, I would say, a consensus pick that was elected with the help of Democrats in order to, oh, and 
uh, Republicans that aren't quite of the Jingle Dell, Al Baldessaro class, in order to forestall just the disaster that was the the, the legislature from 2011 to what was it? It, it, it it's it's there. You go in, in t t December 2010. They went in and they left in December 2012 after right. doing the incredible damage. And one of the reasons. I like Jingle Dell and thought he'd be appropriate for the show is as his cousin Lula Fortune is explaining to her lover Spider and that's Laura Dern, if you see the movie Laura Dern and Nicolas Cage in one of his better roles before whatever happened to Nick, I used to write about film, what happened to Nick Cage's career we won't talk about but Lula is telling Sailor about bad ideas and Jingle Dell who, in my mind, is now a member of the Clown College of Concord from Cornish, which was J.D. Salinger's hometown, uh, was full of bad ideas. Can you tell us, am I incorrect to think that this, even a, a Republican-controlled General Court, is it, we call it as the General Court or the General Court? The General, the general court. court is, um, the, is the, the term that refers yeah. to the whole legislature, right. the just, House and the Senate. Right. So uh, so it is both, but let's just go to the House of Reps. Uh, am I right in thinking that they're full of bad ideas, even under Speaker Jasper? Yeah, yeah. and, you know, it's worth mentioning that um, a, a lot of the folks early on in the session, they, they made a lot of... A lot of a stink about the the election of Speaker Jasper compared to Bill O'Brien, and you know they were making a, a lot of a fuss, claiming that Jasper was going to have some agenda that was different than O'Brien, or that Jasper was going to have some big impact that was going to hurt the Republican agenda. You know they called him a rhino and all that stuff, um, but the the reality has played out entirely as most of us non weird people. Um, have expected that, you know, Sean Jasper's a Republican. He supports Republican policy a positions. A conservative Republican. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, he's he's certainly not giving um, the Democratic Party any special treatment. Um, no. So it, there's no you know, quid pro. There was no quid pro quo with the support yeah, of the Democrats. There's, there's nothing like which that. Which they were claim. you know, they were claiming that this is, oh, he's a Democratic speaker now. Yeah, there's there's none of that. They're They're just being sore losers. But... Yeah, there's there's plenty of bad policy ideas, and you know that's really unrelated to to who the speaker is. It's just a result of some of the folks who get elected and some of the committees they get put on. Like for example, um, if you just look at the state budget, you know one of the things that's going to get cut is their if the house budget were to get passed by the senate. Um, you know, they're going to disband the state police auxiliary. <laughs> I mean, it's it's such a ridiculously bad idea for 50,000 reasons. You know, it's going to increase costs anytime some project needs, you know, state police presence on the side of the highway. If too many state troopers are out sick that day, we're not going to have coverage. You know, they pulled money out of the budget that was going to replace state police cruisers that got wrecked in accidents over the winter. Um they have this idea, you know, they promised they weren't going to downshift any costs from the state budget to the cities right. and towns. Now people are talking about how they want to take some of these red listed bridges and some of these state roads that are in atrocious condition and just dump them down onto the municipalities and say, it's your problem, you deal with it so that the cost of repairing it won't come out of the state budget and they can claim that, you know, they reduced expenses and all that nonsense. But in reality, now your local property taxes are going to go up by who knows how much because all of a sudden your your little town in rural, you know, rural New Hampshire in the middle of the woods and mountains is stuck with like a $12 million bill to right. repair some bridge that is critical for, you know, local infrastructure. Um, I, I can't think of anyone who really seriously would suggest that these are good ideas, um, you know, outside of some partisan talking point setting where they're just trying to push an agenda. One thing I had Maureen Mann, who was uh, did she we, we, did you serve with her, Maureen yeah. Mann? Yep. Maureen Mann, who's up against a uh, nineteen-year-old uh, anarcho-libertarian financed by a Chicago multimillionaire, who incidentally gave over thirteen hundred dollars to wait, wait a minute wait. don't don't the republicans always complain about chicago politics and they use it like it's some dirty word <laughs> i'm sure they're going to run from this from this chicago guy who's giving the money they're not going to want any part of that right 
Right, but our opponents, uh, Tammy Simmons and Dan Garthway, got over thirteen hundred dollars from I this noticed that. one. I I I didn't find out till the miscellany blue, and I had Maureen Mann on the last two weeks, and we're going to talk about Don shifting. But an interesting point, you know that I don't approve of the Clown College of Con- in Concord. I think we should have about 150 reps. I think they should be paid something like 45000 a year, you know, which is not that far out of what people get paid. We're not talking about California and assemblymen that get... When I was running, my ex from Los Angeles says, oh, wow, you know, like, there's a good career step. Because she's thinking of her assemblyman who makes $90,000 a year. <laughs> and virtually has an office and everything because he or she, she and her her district, has to handle constituent services for, geez, half mil, half million people or more. It's a different system there. So, oh, no, no, it's not like that here. <laughs> I think we should have a more professional legislature. But when I was talking to Maureen Mann, who comes from, uh, it was Deerfield, I believe, yep. uh, you could argue that the founding fathers in the, of, of New Hampshire, of which my relatives were, were, uh, were amongst, and I won't name their name in case some crazies go and desecrate their stones or something. But because, and we know certain crazies that live where my family's from I'm that might do it. that, but we're not. We won't touch that. But their idea, I talked to Maureen Mann, was. The 400 people, the citizen legislature, it gives representation to these small towns that otherwise might you feel they're throttled by, you know, legislators from Manchester or Nashua or Portsmouth, the big cities. But how does that work in 2015 when nine, a 19 year old is being financed by a Chicago multi millionaire? Someone, this is, this is in no way an approximation of the voice of the actual people of that town. And this well, is the problem with, I think, with unrestricted campaign, you know, with that, the lack of campaign finance reform, one of your issues. Without campaign finance reform, it's distorting the system. It's distorting the well, state you, of New Hampshire. You just hit on the, the, the main problem right there. Um, you know, a lot of these candidates in different parts of the state, they're looking for the right way to, to sort of articulate this idea. New Hampshire politics for decades now, you, you could even say over a century, you know, has been retail politics, door to door, you know, um, knowing your neighbors, uh, you know, going to community meetings, uh, constituent services. You know, I, I can't, I can't even begin to tell you, you know, how many times um, I've really gone out of my way to, to try and help out a constituent who's gotten touched. Oh, and, I know that. And I the know. majority of state reps will, will do that, you know. Uh, but now, over the last 10 years or so, we've had a growing number of these candidates who are running for office because they want to serve and perform some Gilbertarian social engineering experiment right. rather than, you know, to, to represent their district. And what you're seeing in Maureen Mann's case is a good example. You know, Maureen's a, a great representative. She's served before. Yes. Um, she's very big on constituent services. Um and, you know, this young lady who's running against her is a, a college-age ideologue who doesn't have any any real history or background in public service and is being funded by these out-of-state interests because she's promised to bring this, you know, cutthroat social Darwinism sort of ideology right. into the state house, and Which that's is not... getting her the financing right. of libertarians from Chicago. Right, me... so, so what it's doing is, yeah. is this, this is playing out across a number of races, um, you know, in the house, and it's, it's really, it's slowly transforming New Hampshire state politics yes. to be less about um, representing your district and representing your neighbors up the street and getting it more into, you know, pandering to the special interest and all this stuff where these folks with money can control the representatives through financing. And I, I think that's a, a very dangerous direction. One of the things I brought up with Maureen, uh, who does have a great record of constituent services, was this idea that when you are ideologically driven, and your ideology is to be anti-state, 
to be anti-social services, to roll back services to where there's not even snow plowing. Snow plowing is considered socialism. When you're an ideologue, an anti-statist, you are not going to be predisposed towards constituent services unless it has something to do with some issue like open carry or the ridiculous and erroneous constitutional carry. And I'm a Second Amendment uh, supporter, but that's ridiculous. Oh, you'll support them on that issue, which, but you will not support them like when it comes to, I know that you, and you're not going to say this, helped a certain elderly people actually go and negotiate the maze of the the health and human resources system, which they turn to you and you help them. What if you're against that? What if you don't believe it? And Tim, we actually know people that of that ideology that don't, will not serve in that capacity. No, that's true. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to call anyone right. out specifically, but you know, I've I've been around the state over the last few years. Um, not only you know running for office in in Ward Ten, um, but you know I'm politically active. I, I go to activism events. I go to political conferences, stuff like that. And I I try and make it a point to talk to people. You know, and get sort of a cross section of where everyone's at. Um, and it's surprising how often that comes up. You know, someone will will say to me, "Oh, you're a state rep." And they'll immediately have some anecdote about working with their own state rep. Sometimes yes. it's positive, you know, like I talk to my state rep and they really help me get that pothole fixed. Or sometimes it's very negative. You know, I talked to my state rep, I was having this problem with like renewing my fishing license and they came back and said, you know, well, I don't think we should even have a fishing game department, so I'm not going to help with that. <laughs> exactly. Right. I mean, what, what kind of a person has that attitude towards a constituent who needs some help? You know, and I, I guarantee that you wouldn't run into that as recently as 10 years ago. You know, because now, as we were saying a few minutes ago, this wave of just ideologues who have no interest in serving their district. Um, or in community. In, yeah, no they interest don't in, believe community. in community. Yeah, you know, they're, of they're, sweeping, they're sweeping into, into office in these safe partisan districts just by running, you know, on whichever party is more popular in their district. Um, and it's it's a real problem. I mean, I think that it know, is a problem for the Democrats well, when you have people running like under the free state banner that are actually Republicans and whose campaigns that we I know of that were stage managed by Republicans. But because they're di their district, there is a scale and you probably know it better than I. What is it? The congressional scale? It goes up to 10. Ten, does it go to 10 re Democrat to 10 Republican? Oh, yeah. We were like one Democrat, which means a swing district. Some people run in like, well, I'm in a, a plus five Democrat. And even though I am really, well, I, it, it doesn't have to do with party. But uh, even though I'm a right winger, well, I'll run as a Democrat. And uh, yeah, that, that it's, that's a new and phenomenon. And it's outrageous because in your caucus, <laughs> They, I don't want to say they're traitorous or anything, but... Uh, well, you know, it's it's a problem for the Republicans as well, because a lot of these candidates who've cropped up over the last decade or so, oh, yeah. they're yeah. not, I mean, they may vote with the Republicans a lot of the time, but they're not actually Republicans. Right, the Bill O'Brien, you know? Sean Jasper. Yeah, because, Jasper, you know, Hassel, I mean, yeah. I, you know, we you ran for office and, and here in Manchester. You know, I, when I was campaigning, I, I don't... I don't discriminate. I talk to the Republicans. I want, oh, to, yeah. I, want to, I want to hear what they have to say. And, you know, Republicans are interested in paving the roads and plying the streets just like anyone else. They have different ideas about how we should pay for it, and they want to make sure it's not too expensive and everything else, and that's fine. And, you know, Republicans who are regular people, which is most of them, yes. are not represented by these, you know, these ideological right. folks who are just running in these partisan districts. And I, I don't want to say they're misrepresenting what they're all about. Um, but I'm not entirely sure people realize what they're doing once they get up to Congress yes. after the election. And Tim, I had to smile when you said that because when we were on the hustings together and you, I think you, you found out it, it was better not to expose me to any Republicans, right? Good yeah. old hot-headed hoppy. Oh, look at this picture of uh, that jackass from Ted, well, they didn't say that, but Ted Cruz. <laughs> I'm colorblind, but I'm sure I turned like six shades of red and steam. <laughs> you, you, you became animated. <laughs> well, we only have like about uh, six or seven minutes left. Uh, 
I don't think we have time for campaign finance reform. We can always get back to that. Uh, I, uh, John, can you show those photos? I saw Je Jeb Bush. Isn't that a great picture if you see it? it there is. he is. Clinton country. <laughs> Hillary was there. Well, it's, and, a, it's a good uh, pose for Jeb. Can you show the other one? If you see over to the right, there's his brother. And at the extreme left is his father. I'm going to say that's one formidable man. I'm going to describe that's the, Nash, the New Hampshire Institute of Politics up at uh, St. A's where I played as a child. That used to be the National Guard Armory. Yep. And uh, that is a killing floor. In the slaughterhouse, that's a killing floor. I saw Perry of Texas, Rick Perry, immolate himself right on that floor when he's talking. <laughs> about, yeah, and then you know when they're 21, uh, the kids can go vote, and uh, that's a killing floor. Jeb Bush, a formidable candidate that made me kind of reassess my stand on Hillary Clinton. But uh, that I'd like to. You actually met Hillary Clinton recently. I did. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, she had um, a, a meet and greet for state legislators the other day um, up at the, the Democratic Party headquarters in Concord. Right. Um, you know, so it was uh, an opportunity for a number of us state reps. Um, there was uh, at least one state senator there. Uh, Councillor Pappas was there. You know, just to sort of uh, see what she's all about, hear what she had to say, um, chit chat for a few minutes. You know, in, in an informal setting. Um, it was a, it was an interesting experience. Did you get any one on one time with her? Uh, very briefly. Um, I I I was hoping to get um, a few minutes, but you know it, it ended up being just a very brief exchange. Um, I I asked about Wall Street reform. I um, got a, a, a generic ish answer. Um, I, I think that she seems to at least understand that hey you know there's a problem here. Um, and that's more than we can say about the candidates on the other side, unfortunately. We got three minutes left. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, Hillary is uh, financed by Wall Street, and she has a problem, all right. It's with progressive Democrats like us <laughs> who would like to see Liz Warren's name on the ballot. And uh, you got, uh, we got a couple minutes left. What would you like to say to the audience? Uh, you, you, you have a, I like to say you have a camera over there. Is there anything you'd like to say to them or you can just say it to me? What um, is the major issue you're confronting right now other than campaign finance reform, which we'll have you back on the show to talk about? Um, well, I think the, the biggest issue we're all uh, working on right now is the, the budget and finances yeah. for the state. Um, there's a, a casino bill that just came out of the committee um, with an ought to pass recommendation. We're going to be voting on that next week. Um, gotten a lot of feedback from constituents in the district. I'd like to say as one of your constituents, I'm not a fan of casinos other than for my allergies. They pump the air in. <laughs> but I believe that in the economic climate where, where we have and what's going on, the and the downturn I'm predicting because once again the Republicans are in control, cutting infrastructure, attacking education, which discourages discourages business. If I had been elected, I'd be strongly supporting it. Where I was equivocal last time, and I would be supporting because we need that revenue. Well, and the, um, the I'm the, not here to lobby you. No, and no, not at all. The you um, have to you know the, I the respect you and. Well, the, uh, that's the, what, that would be my opinion. We need that revenue. Well, the, the feedback I've been getting um, from folks in the district uh, has actually been pretty evenly split. It's been uh, around 20 people, you know, who've gotten touch yeah. saying that they really like it and about 20 people saying that they really don't like it. Um, With it, Massachusetts having a casino, see, to me, that that's a real game changer. Well, there's, it, it adds another element of dynamics. I mean, you know, last term I, I voted against the casino bills. My, but after careful thought, I know, yeah, how, I mean, you, my, I know my, how you deliberate. My, uh, my concerns are not philosophical. My concerns right. are technical. Yes. Um, and I, I have some concerns with the current casino bill that right. are technical. Um, and, and they may get addressed through an amendment. Um, yes. I, I you know, I've heard talk of at least three or four uh, floor amendments that people are going to try and propose to the bill okay. uh, when it comes up next week. And there, there's no way to predict, you know, yeah. what amendments will pass, what amendments will fail. Gambling is always, you know, um, if you pardon the pun, it's a roll of the dice. It really you know, is. In, in the House up in Concord. So. I'll just tell you, we could go on for the whole show. There's plenty of gambling going on right now. And <laughs> I could tell you stories. I could tell you politicians. Uh, I could tell <laughs> the whole the whole shebang. But we really don't have time. Uh, would you like this uh, egg I got from the Jeb Bush? 
we 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 we'll uh, leave that uh, better left unsaid about that. But Tim, I'd like uh, let me just tell you, Manchester, this man reads every bill. He is he's extremely serious about this. He's in the clown college up there, but he's no clown. He should be one of the 150. Uh, prof I would like to say professional, at least pro am. You know, I used to live near Pebble Beach. There is pro am. Pro -am. Well, you know, we get a hundred dollars per year. That's plenty. <laughs> and everybody said on the hustings, you get what you pay for. But it's time <laughs> to uh, sign off now, Tim. And we'd like to end with a little tribute to the Clown College in Concord. Present company uh, accepted. <laughs> Roll it, uh, John. on the ground I didn't make a sound then I turned around and I saw a clown had a frown stood on a mound started barking like a hound I wondered what to do I didn't know what to think so I got a drink and then I showed it something that was round. Then it died, smiled, fell on the ground. Thinking back about those days with the clown, I get teary-eyed and, and really snide. I think that deep down, I hated that clown, but not as much. Mr. Farr, I'm gonna go smoke a cigar. I was walking on the ground, I didn't make a sound, and then I turned around, I saw a clown. Clown. Clowny clown clown. Ha <laughs> ha.